What is good, everybody? Welcome live to San Diego Comic Con 2024. We are here today with none other than Steve Ozer. Bill couldn't join us today. He's been on his feet all day, and he did two interviews before this one. So we sent him through a full media day. So totally understandable. But we do have Steve here, and we're going to just continue on what we got. We got some questions lined up for him. Should be fun. Always enjoy San Diego Comic Con, and this should be a blast. We got a ton of reveals out there, but today we are going to be questioning Steve Ozer and the Mattel team. Steve, how are we feeling? Good until you said you'll be questioning me. He know he knows what he's getting himself into. No, I don't. I really, honestly, I don't think I have. Yeah, I don't. I, I mean, I don't know. I haven't looked through all the questions that I wrote down or what the questions have been. So we'll just get into it. Let's get into it with the first question. But before we start, I think it was a very successful Comic Con. Everybody seemed to be really excited. I think it did. It did seem to be 95% positive of what I've seen, and that's always a good sign. So. Yeah, I feel like, you know, the, the there al there's always going to be complaints, but they were a little bit of a stretch for a lot of them. Some understandable, right? But uh, but a lot of them, a little bit of a reach, so that's a good thing. Absolutely. So I'm going to get into the first question, so let's get things started. All right, so the first question here is, so we have the Monday Night Wars line, and, you know, some people would say maybe the Monday Night Wars line is from this year to this year. You know, you have your different eras. For Mattel specifically, where does that Monday Night War sort of begin, and where does it end? And, you know, how can you uh, you fit it into this specific area? Is there a specific area you won't stretch into? You know, maybe say 2000, 2001, maybe where it ends for you or where Mattel looks at it? As far as like you know, uh, uh, pulling from WWE content, like what we're going to use for for figures and, and, and superstars, it's the entirety of the Monday Night War, the true entirety of those two shows going head to head. So that first episode of Nitro from the Mall of America, all the way through that uh, Spring Break episode of, of Nitro, which was the final uh, Nitro that that you know certain WWE personalities appeared on. Okay, so there you go. That's I think that's probably the best way to do it, and that, that makes the most sense to me. So I think that that's that's pretty good. All right, so my next question is going to get into pinless joints. You know, people that watch the reviews of mine, they watch other reviews, at least for me personally. I know a lot of people think that it looks aesthetically better. A lot of people think that it has improved the line in ways. Me, I think that I'm probably, I'm in the middle because I think that, of course, aesthetic matters on a figure, but I also think that posability, I think that mobility matters a ton when we're referring to these figures, especially when we're talking about wrestling. So I think that, you know, at least the figures I've seen, I've seen it around the community, you know, the pinless joints, while aesthetically they look nice they are a little stiff out of the packaging specifically is there any way have you guys looked into that is there a way of improving that is there you know you don't want to have to pull it you don't want to tell your your consumers all right when you get out of the packaging you got to heat them up for a minute you know you don't want to ever do that you want it to come out of the packaging feeling really smooth and it seems like pin joints were a lot better at that and do you have anything to, to test to the pin list is there have you looked into improving that or anything like that yeah, uh, we weren't the first to do pinless. Um, you know, we, we jumped in where improvement, improvements had already been made, and we're aware that you know some some of the joints have a little stiffness, and the, the team is hard at work in, in trying to make that even better. So you know, if you were collecting figures of any line uh, when this pinless started, some of them were. were Non, non mobile whatsoever, right? So we're at a better place now, and it's going to keep keep getting better and better as time goes by. So they're working on it. It's going to improve. Hang tight. Uh, but yeah, if you do have some issues, you know, reach out to Mattel, and they'll try to you know replace those figures for you or get you a voucher or something. All right. So my next question falls into greatest hits. Of course, there's tons of greatest hits lines. We have the greatest hits. We have the best of Monday Night War. We have the top picks. Even you would say are kind of a re-release wave in some ways, right? And so my next question is, you know, back in the first edition of the Greatest Hits line, I, th I think I even asked you guys, I asked, you know, well, Seth Rollins, he had a brand new formula. You know, he had, uh, he, he's been updated since then. Why did you re-release him with this same exact mold when you've previously fixed it? So moving forward, you know, we saw it in AJ Styles where you did improve the formula. You changed it up a little bit. So moving forward, if you did, I think Seth Rollins is in the next Greatest Hits wave or uh, a, an upcoming Greatest Hits wave. Outside of maybe a shield greatest hits, which we've already seen, I imagine his legs would be the improved formula. Is that something you're going to look into, or is it going to be back reverted to the old way, even though you've upgraded guys like AJ Styles and there's, you know, so so on and so forth? I would hope it would be the new formula. Um, you know, the thing is, everything evolves over time, right? That first greatest hits wave, we had restrictions that we. He had was to lying to me that whole time. I know he was. Yeah. Uh, we just don't want to fix things. Um, but, you know, we want to do the best product possible, which is why we kind of push the limits of what, you know, a carry forward re-release figure is. 
Uh, and we've been able to over time, you know, working with the factory and they're like, okay, you know, we'll do this for you. We'll update the, the legs, we'll update some parts, you know, we'll add some new accessories. Um, and we'll keep doing that where appropriate, of course. You know, you know, it, it's, it's 2024 going into 2025 and we want the figures to reflect that. That's perfect. So this means, would you say that, let's say the first go around of a random character, uh, maybe the community, or maybe you notice, like maybe that wasn't the best choice. I, I know you've improved Solo Sokoa since then, but let's say maybe the Elite 107 never was released and you want to redo Elite 104. Maybe you come back around to a greatest hits. Would, would that be something that you could upgrade, like upgrade a former figure that maybe wants a re-release or needed a re-release? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I don't know that you're going to see new tooling involved with anything re-release, because then it's totally not a re-release anymore. Um, but if there's ways with existing parts we can finesse that figure to improve it, um, yeah, we'll totally try to do it. That's awesome. I think that's a really good thing for the, you know, for the community to hear is improvement. That's all we ask for, really, at least in my eyes, is I want to see steady improvement where, you know, nobody bats a thousand, as we like to say, even myself, right? Like, even if you know, whatever I'm working on, I want to improve over time because I, you know, that shows growth and you, you want to keep getting better. You want to keep getting better at these things. So that's always nice to hear. So the next question is going to be about play sets. As we know, I, I feel like, at least off the top of my head, I feel like we haven't really had a lot of play sets from Mattel in terms of wrestling in a while. Maybe outside of the Slam Mobiles, the Wrecking Mobiles that I love, by the way, they're very fantastic. The ATV is great. The, the Slambulance is fantastic. I personally love them. And I know you got to capitalize on both markets. They may look a bit toyish at times. They may be more kid friendly, but I think that it's good because as a business model, you can pick up on both kids and collectors alike. You can pick up on toy photography and things. And if you, hell, you want to repaint that truck and make it look better, you can do so. So I, I have no problems with that, but I think they're great. In terms of play sets though, I think we're, we're a little bit lacking, you know? Back in the day, I know, I don't even think you were with Mattel at that time, but you know, we got more of the backstage things and we got these, you know, all these different things. And even kids like me, you know, growing up, we had jacks, they put up play sets all the time of backstage assault or, or parking lot this or this or that. Is that something that we could possibly see in the future? Or is there any ideas on that? So we do have a few playset type things out, especially if they're they're ring based. Like we have a War Games playset that's been available off and on in the U.S. for the last few years, and readily available in the U.K. for the last few years. Uh, the three count ring at Walmart, um, Steel Cage at Target, the the more modern version, and then now more recently the classic version. Um, but it comes down to you know what retail wants, what they want to carry, what they think is going to be successful for them. I'll use that War Games as an example. It's been very successful with Smiths UK, so they keep wanting more of it, which is why it's lived so long, right? So if there's an opportunity to to bring something back, you know, out of our vault or create something new, we absolutely want to do it. But unfortunately, you know, those time frames you're talking about, like those those places that specifically lived at Kmart that you mentioned, we don't have Kmart anymore. We don't have Toys R Us anymore. So it's much more limited to where we can offer these things. And, you know, uh, the stores will decide what they want to carry. We can't just say, hey, there's Amazon. You're going to take this. It doesn't work that way. We pitch things to them and they decide what they're going to take. So we want to do it. Uh, whenever opportunities arise, we will pitch for this type of stuff and then keep our fingers crossed that uh, that they're, they're taken and we can get these out there. Beautiful. I think I, I was talking to Ringside Collectibles about a similar issue where, you know, I mean, it's kind of like Ringside Collectibles has had to kind of step up and take on that void left by Toys R Us and, you know, the KB Toys of the world. So. You know, maybe maybe even ringside collectibles may be into something like that, but I think that uh, it's definitely something that would be appreciated by collectors and things like that outside of a ring base, right? So I, I think that's good. So one thing we've seen, we've seen with Build-A-Figures mostly, we see the suited figures, we see Howard Finkel in the new WrestleMania line. We've seen, you know, John Cone, a referee, you know, maybe not a guy that's a mainstay. You know, you kind of, you know, people know who he is and, you know, they want a referee figure and he's personalized and things. And we've even gotten, you know, Nicholas, as a build a figure so have you ever looked into maybe doing these commentators guys like Corey Graves guys like Michael Cole in suit you know Michael Cole he had a build a figure previously and we've seen basics of course but are these guys that we could pot potentially see an elite wave or would it have to be in a build a figure type you know uh, series or something of that nature or is that something that you don't like to lean into or what, what is your your thoughts and process on that I don't think it's a never say never that you'll absolutely not see them as single figure releases. 
But you know, I think there's, there's the thought in the toy industry that that suited figures don't sell, and we know there's exceptions to the rule. You know that that Cody Rhodes in a suit sold great, and I'm sure there's other lines that have you know characters that are synonymous with wearing a suit that sell great. But it's kind of a thing. It's kind of out there, and it's a it's a hurdle to overcome. So the the most straightforward path are build a figures for these characters. Will you see them in the line? Some of those names you mentioned, most likely. Uh, will they most likely be be build a figures? Probably, um, but if, if something comes up to where it could be a single figure or a multi pack, perhaps you know we'll we'll try to do that, of course. Uh, but you know the the straightforward path really are build a figures for those. Perfect. And another thing is, you know, we just got Adam Pierce. Adam Pierce is a build a figure. It's another another suited character. Maybe you don't want to put him out in like a main elite line. And I think that you know like a Nick Aldis would probably fall in somewhere in that same category if you wanted to make a Nick Aldis figure. So that is, uh, yeah, I, I can understand that process. So we've seen with Target, Target exclusive, a wave that I'm very, very excited for. Honestly, I think the Roman Reigns and the Cody Rhodes are probably two of the most anticipated figures of the year for me just because of, and I'm not even a TMNT guy, but the, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was a crossover. Was that something like the Ghostbusters where it was an opportunity that you took or it was just an opportunity that arose that you know you wanted to capitalize on? Or is there other collabs maybe like a Marvel or some other obscure license that you could sort of collab with on a WWE line? Is that something that could be possibly in the cards or never say never? Or what, what is the uh, thought process on that? Or is there anything future detailed on future collabs with other brands like we saw with TMNT? I'm sure there's going to be more over time. Uh, the beauty is, you know, in this industry, like we're all friendly, we friendly with each other. We all talk, we all negotiate, you know. Um, so, you know, through those conversations and partnerships and friendships, you know, it opens the doors for opportunities like TMNT or Ghostbusters or whatever else is to come. You know, there's definitely things that we're we're trying to work on right now for for whatever the next mashup will be. And there's lots of ideas of of what that could be going forward. Could it be a Marvel? Could it be a DC? Could it be something else? Sure, of course, of course. But you know, it's definitely a case of like you know things have to come together in the right moment in time for them things to come to fruition. You know, sometimes an anniversary is in play. You know, I think there's a big anniversary year for TMNT. Uh, you know, happening now or about to happen. Uh, same thing for Ghostbusters. An anniversary was about to happen, um, or just you know it's the right time for the partnership. So we're going to keep doing them, uh, but they do take a little bit longer than your traditional, you know, elite or main event execution. Perfect, perfect. And that, I mean, that Ghostbusters wave did come out. It's been a while since that came out. So I think it was a perfect timing. And I like it because it kind of catches us all off guard. Like nobody's thinking, oh, they're going to do a collab with TMNT and then boom, it drops and everybody's hyped. So that's all good with me. And that, that Cody Rhodes, I'm telling you, that Cody Rhodes, it, it, don't even watch the top 10. It's going to be number four at least. So so we saw with the World Heavyweight Championship, something that I've been clamoring for for a long time now. And there's so many improvements to the line, which is always a, a testament to you guys, honestly, because, you know, like that steady improvement that we talk about, the things get better as the line is going. I mean, it, I was telling Sam Roberts just the other day here at Comic-Con, it's so refreshing to see if you look at the line in 2010, I mean, it, it's almost, if you look at the figure from 2010, you look at a figure from 2024 or 2025, it's almost like a completely new line now with the new molds and the new sculpts and the formulas are different and the cloth goods are better and the, you know, the inventory of the parts you can use and all these different things has improved so much that it's essentially like, I don't know, you've injected like a fresh, a freshness into the line. It's, it's pretty insane to see. So, you know, with that retooled World Heavyweight Championship, are we going to continue to see that across the line with other championships? Could we see, you know, a new winged eagle or, or you know, retooling these belts that maybe aren't as good as maybe they could be or as detailed as maybe they could be? Or is that something that you've looked into now that we have that first step in there? Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, the, the, the World Heavyweight Championship, the reason was, like, there was such demand for a non-WWE version of that. Uh, but with the other titles, those tools don't last forever, right? And I think there was another q and I did. It may have been with you or someone else, maybe Ringside, where they asked specifically about the Winged Eagle. And I promised when that tool is up and used up and needs to be refreshed, we're not going to refresh it. We're just going to do a brand new version. John Cena shoe mold, get the hell out of here. It's it's done. It's done. R.I.P. John Cena shoe mold. <laughs> but yes, yes, I think you know that's the perfect time to do it. You know, you know we're going to have to spend the money at that time. Um, so yeah, expect expect revisions and improvements um, when it's time to truly upgrade those. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful answer to hear, Brad. We we love to hear that. So obviously, very sad day. We know that last year we all failed miserably. I'm talking to you and me. We all failed. He did too. 
Even my cameraman failed. We all failed. We didn't succeed on our Nitro stage. We really wanted it to fund. The crowdfunding project did come to a close, obviously. Didn't get what we needed. However, with that said, we're going to come back bigger and better than ever. Well, I don't know about bigger. Maybe not bigger. Maybe better, not bigger. Better, yeah. I'm looking at you people. <laughs> I didn't care. But, you know, we, we did fail. But, you know, we... It's usually every other year we'll get some sort of cool new project and we're coming up on 2025. I mean, I know we're halfway through the year, but you'll blink and it'll be 2025. And with that said, I know that you like to plan things in advance. So has there been movement? Has there been any traction on what maybe the next crowdfunder will be? I'm not saying you have to give me a teaser. You don't have to give me something, but is there at least, can can the community know? Can we know that, you know, there's, there's steps being, there's at least like a puzzle piece on the table for the complete picture? Yeah, yeah. I think we have kind of in mind. There's a couple concepts that are that are uh, leading our ideas, but uh, I think there's one that that is the front runner. Um, and you know, there was some previous work done. We paused it. There's a lot going on, and I think we'll probably revisit, revisit work on that uh, in the next like month to two months. Um, but yeah, th there's going to be some new crowdfund type of execution. You know, maybe maybe you know the formula of how we do that is tweaked a little bit. I don't know yet. Um, but yeah, the, the team is, is uh, going to be working on something very shortly, picking up uh, what they started a little while back. But you know, I kind of think I know what it's going to be. Um, and if that one doesn't pan out, we've got other ideas in the hopper as well that we can use as, as you know, plan Bs that are all really exciting and solid. Okay, perfect. I just, whatever it is, my hope is that, you know, we, we at least get it funded. I don't care if it's by one person or if we hit the criteria completely. I say, like, we got to fund the thing. you got to get it funded. Like, two L's in a row is not a good look, and that's not a good look in terms of, you know, people that don't have anything to do with collecting, you know. So I think that, you know, you want to get those things done so you have that successful track record so that when you come back, it's like, well, this funded. Well, now we can do this and so on and so forth. But I know, obviously, the tiers have to make sense and, you know, the process has to make sense. But, you know, I hope that, you know, we'll be successful this time, you know. And nobody bats a 1,000, but you don't want to bat zero, you know what I mean? So that's, that's what I hope for the future. So one thing that I was actually really excited for, now I know not everybody, like, I don't think the average Joe off the street gives a, a single damn about somebody's boots or this mold's not right or whatever. And I, you know, I feel like for a long time, Mattel, I don't know if it's you specifically or what, but I feel like for the most part, if it's not broke, don't fix it. You know, it gets the job done. Why would I want to? And this really is a good question for Bill probably, but you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Why do you think now was a good time to, to retool those feet for everybody? Why do you think that, you know, a lot of the times you'll mention, you know, do we want money here? Do we want money there? What what really inspired the, the change in the feet and everything? But personally, I love it. I think it's a fantastic addition, and it adds into what I was talking about earlier about, you know, the improvements to the line, slow, you know, methodical improvement. Comparing it to an older figure, the feet would be completely different nowadays, which is what I was kind of, you know, touching on. You know, why was now the right time, and why did you guys feel that was a priority over maybe some other things that could have listed? I couldn't really think of anything, but you know, what what is the deal there? What was your what was the team's thought process on something like that? So as you know, over the last several years, we've kind of had like an improvement initiative per year, right? Like one year it was TrueFX, DIJ, Facial Deco. It was double jointed arms. It was pinless, right? Uh, we're kind of doing new torsos for some superstars now, unique torsos to that superstar, superstar like you saw with the new Triple H Ultimate. So, you know, what do we do, uh, you know, for 2025 uh, that you know is, is a little bit overdue, modernizes our, modernizes our figures, makes them better, makes them more poseable. And I think you know the boots and feet, the articulation there was something that I saw repeated by a lot of people, including you. Like you know, how do we improve these John Cena shoes, right? Um, so we've modernized that articulation on the foot. They're really nice, and you know that was just the initiative we wanted to take. It's the invest investment we decided to take into the line for 2025. Perfect. You, again, I have no complaints about it. I would not be the first to complain about it. You know, the, the things that I really reiterate on the channel in terms of improvement, the John Cena shoe mold was really outdated. I mean, I, I make the joke, but it was legitimately true. Like, in two years, that, that shoe mold could drive legally, you know? And we didn't want those out on the street. But I think that's good. I always appreciate the, the movement towards improvement and everything like that. We'd love to see that. All right, and my final question here, this is just for me personally. I have three requests, and then I'm done. All right, first of all, it's the faded, tapered Roman Reigns beard. I know it's been attempted. All right, I saw it on the basic in there. The side is correct, and then the it's a basic, though. I really don't care that much about a basic. It's a main event. 
It's a main event. It's a main event. They'll always be basics to me, damn it. No. But faded taper beards, is it, do you think it's more of a, I know the team's very talented, obviously. I don't think it's like a talent issue. Is it more of a capability issue? Is that something that, like, you just run into difficulty with deco or trying to get that correct, like with a gradient? Or is it more of just, what's the challenge there? What's the, or maybe it's just not priority, or what's the thinking there? It could be. There could be deco challenges uh, in production that are holding it up, and they're just trying to work through that over there. But the teams, you know, they're going to get there. Uh, maybe it's a couple more releases away, but uh, they're working on it. And then, obviously, Finn Balor would go in that same category. I haven't seen the Ultimate Edition, right? We only, There's only one new head sculpt on the Ultimate Edition, which I was kind of disappointed in. However, you know, if, if I haven't seen the prototype, I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what it looks like painted, so I can't make a judgment on a render on a faded beard, correct? But... I hope that, you know, like Finn Balor and Roman Reigns are two of those guys. But then my final thing would be, can we lower the Cody Rhodes tattoo just a little so that it is only on the neck and not on the jaw? So that when he turns his head, you don't get that ba big gap in the thing there. And I know that obviously, like we've seen it with other companies, they've made it where it's not on the face. And I can agree that maybe there's maybe a little bit too low. Is there some way we can find just a way to get that, whether it's maybe sacrificing a little bit of accuracy so that you don't get that weird aesthetic issue. So I did recently see an early sample of a new uh, main event Cody where our main event designer, John Lee, had, had lowered it, and I think he found a nice sweet spot for it. Um, as far as anything you know, elite goes, it's going to be up to the individual designer for that. But, you know, everyone will talk and everyone will try to align and we'll see what happens. But I already know that, you know, some of our designers are trying to find that perfect sweet spot for it. So you'll see that first, at least on, on main event figures. Okay, perfect. And I think we did see it on the, the promo hoodie, Cody. I think it is lowered. It's in the right spot. And we've seen it on other Cody's. I think it's more of, you know, you can take the jawline. If, if the jaw the jawline would have to be here so that that point, you know, it's that point that, you don't want it to disappear. Like, I understand the issue with that. You don't want it to disappear. But I think, you know, at some points you got to sacrifice a little bit of aesthetics or accuracy. Maybe you want to sacrifice that for, okay, why is the tattoo on his face? Like, you don't want that question to come up. So even if, okay, the tattoo needs to be a little closer. But I've stated on the channel in the reviews that, you know, the tattoo, there's a gap between the ear and the top of the point, And it doesn't see that reflected on the figures. And maybe it's just an instance of, you know, it is that close. And it's just you run it. But... Hopefully, you know, that is something that we can be improved on. And, you know, I, I know that you will also, you know, go to bat for things and, you know, help the community as well. So we appreciate that. But anyways, guys, I think that is pretty much going to wrap up my interview with Steve Ozer with Mattel here at San Diego Comic-Con 2024. I really appreciate your time as always. Hopefully, you know, all the questions, I wasn't offensive or, you know, you're not going to stab me in the back as I leave this place. But hopefully everything went well. I really appreciate your time. And obviously, I think that the line's probably in the best spot it's ever been personally. You know, from the time I entered into this, you know, this space, you know, started the channel, whatever it is, the line has improved just immensely. And, you know, we've, we've, we've gotten these little additions here and there, things that I've put on my list, things that people put on their list. And we've seen these improvements, like we've talked about this entire, you know, interview. And I greatly appreciate that. And I can always appreciate that. And, you know, uh, so I, I do want to thank you for the time and thank you for, you know, what you do for us. My pleasure. Anytime. Well, that's it. That's going to do it for San Diego Comic-Con 2024 interview with the Mattel design team. Appreciate everybody for watching, man. Thank you guys so very much. Leave me your thoughts down below. Leave a like on the video. I'll see you guys on the next one. Have a blessed one.